Hello and welcome back to Up The Villa podcast. If you are new, subscribe to our channel, drop this video a like and get involved in the comment section down below. So we'll start off with some good news. Well, good news for me, good news for the channel, uh, hopefully good news for everybody that supports Aston Villa. And that is, I am going on the overlap. Yes. So I will be on the overlap next week representing Aston Villa. Let's go. Um, so that's a good bit of positive news to start the podcast on. Justin, how are you? Very good, mate, and congratulations. It's um, Thank it's a you. really good, uh, really good thing to be uh, to be going on there representing Villa. You'll do us Definitely. proud, mate. <laughs> I know I will. Right, so two games to go before the start of the Premier League twenty three twenty four season. How are you feeling? It's mad. It's mad, isn't it? It's come round really quick, hasn't it? I know we touched on it the other day, we were talking, but yeah, it's great. I love this time of year when it's really close. You know, the kits are out now, the, the, the teams are starting to focus, the fantasy football leagues, everybody's tweaking their team, wondering what they're going to do and who they're going to sign. And we know it's, you know, basically this is the last boring week, if you like, uh, before it starts, because the build-up every week is fantastic, isn't it? From that first Monday, when you know you've got a game at the weekend. So, once the last weekend's gone, where there's no football, I know we've got a couple of friendlies, but it's not like the real thing, is it? Once we get to that Monday, when the, it's game week, it's... Uh, can't wait, mate. Can't wait. And what a game to start us off with as well. It's that, it's that where, like, all through pre-season, you've been... Having the jobs thrown at you on your weekends. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? Put this shelf up. And then when when the Villa are back, sorry, my weekends are <laughs> very, is very it, busy. Is it sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> so there we go. So Lazio, Warsaw, Poundland Beskett Stadium, if that's what it's still called. That's going to be a, a tasty, tasty affair on Thursday night. We are doing a watch-along for it, so come and join us if you aren't at the game. But it feels like, and, you know, how you expect pre-season to be, it starts off at a slower pace. It starts ramping up. You start to sort of get more players getting more minutes than what there were at the start. So, you know, we saw the last game, Martinez getting loads of minutes, etc. So... This is going to be a big test, isn't it? Justin Lazio are, are a good side. Yeah, hugely good side. To be honest, I had a quick look for a come just to double check where they finished last season in Serie A, and they finished runners up, didn't they? It was a very, very tight league, very competitive league, and they they managed to nick second spot. Napoli ran away with it, but after that, Lazio into Milan. I see Milan, you know, they, they were all sort of the next sort of next three teams. And they're a good side, aren't they? They've built well. Uh, they have lost the player this summer, Milinkovic Savic, to the dreaded Saudi league. So, uh, you know, he's gone. But they've, they've recruited one or two as well. And and they're a big they're a big name, aren't they? You know, I remember the, back in the day when, when Gaza went out to play in Lazio and, you know, everybody became sort of a, a bit of a second team was Lazio, wasn't it? Uh, amazing stadium, amazing atmosphere. I don't. I wonder if they'll bring fans. You know, I don't know whether they can. Whether there's there's uh, away fans allowed in. Uh, it'd be interesting to see one or two Italians, maybe locals mm -hmm. that maybe support them. Uh, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it should, it should be good. We've had a really good pre-season. We've ramped it up. The Warsaw game, you know, the least you know exciting game, I suppose you like. Then Newcastle, Fulham, Brentford, and then we we ramp it up again with two really interesting and high-profile uh, friendlies with Lazio, and then we go to. To Valencia then before the big kickoff. So this one, I think we're going to see. We're going to go into it in more detail, I'm sure. But um, it's it's we are now starting to see the real nuts and bolts, aren't we, of, of pre season and trying to nail down where we're going to be come a week on on Saturday. I mean, if them um, Lazio fans are at Warsaw, they're going to have a bit of an eye opener, aren't they? <laughs> yes, walking around the best stuff. I can say it because I'm from Warsaw, so uh feel like I can say that. But, um, yeah, so it's going to be a big test. Uh, somebody who has had a big challenge thrown in this pre-season is Philogene. And coming out now, looks like there's going to be no lone move for Philogene. He's going to be sticking around 
at Aston Villa this season. And it's, I've got to say, you've got to give Villa credit here because this is what we want to happen to our youngsters. We want them to progress really well through our academy. Then we want to set them up with their next challenges, i.e. low moves, let them learn, let them grow, let them mature, let them apply their trade in different leagues, come back to Aston Villa in a pre-season. The manager has a good look at him and he's decided, you know what, you're staying. And I think that's yeah. a great testament to everything to do with his development at Aston Villa because that's ideally what we want to happen to all of these players that do go out on loan, that they, they do progress and grow and get better and better. And I've said it since he's come back to pre-season, he's, he's the one name that I think wasn't on everybody's radar because he gets overshadowed by an Archer, a Ramsey and etc. But we did say on this channel that, I, I remember saying at the Warsaw game, that we think he's going to like Philogene. And yeah. I think I've seen what Unai's seen is that he can understand the message that he's meant to be getting and what he's meant to be doing. He's tactically very astute. His positional awareness is very good. He offers a threat in the opposition box. He just looks like he can fulfil a role. And we're going to get on to the role of Aston Villa in a second. But I think I think he's, one, going to save money. And two, it's really exciting. Absolutely. I think um, what's important for these kids, not only the ones that break through and do what Bidais has done, um, is, is not only to get to that point when they're, they're, they're becoming a first teamer, is to show players that are below them that there is this pathway open to them. You know, we've we've made huge strides off the pitch, signing loads and loads of young players when we first, when the ownership changed over you know one of their big mantras was to come in and redevelop and and almost throw everything out the window and start again with the kids you know get rid of the 20 mid 20 year olds that sit around in the reserves and bring in the 16 17 18 year olds and progress them through quickly into the first team and what's very important to every player we try to sign going forward is that that they see that there are players from the academy that are making the breakthrough and they are being seen and they are being watched and they are being given the chance to to show that they can cut it at the, at the top, and you know, Philogene Bidais is the real standout from from the summer. You know, started every single game uh, on the US tour, started against Warsaw, and, and was really good. You know, didn't look out of place at all. Looked very comfortable. Looked like he was he was loving it. And you know, he, does he add any less threat than Torore or even dare I say it, Bailey? On, on what I've seen, you know, he's, he's on a par with those kind of players. And, you know, Bailey especially costs us a lot of money. That's not disregarding uh, Bailey. I'm just saying that's how good Bidais looks like he could be. And it's very, it's it's hard to sort of put too high a ceiling on them because they are kids and, and you do see these peaks and troughs with them where that, you know, one week they'll look amazing then they might get missing for a bit. This is what's such an important, hard thing for a manager to, to, to give these players their head because that there is still a bit of fluctuation with their performances, but I think we've definitely seen enough of him and it looks like the manager's seen enough of him to keep him around. I know it helps the quota thing with Europe and everything else, but I don't see Unai Emery keeping these players around just for the sake of it. You know, he's not that kind of manager. If he sees a genuine player there and there's a chance for him to integrate into the first team and even push for a place, you know, off the bench to start with, obviously, and maybe starts in the early round of cup competition, then then brilliant. You know, we all want to see kids coming through. There is no better sight uh, when you're at Villa Park, sold out game, when you see one of the youth team players standing on that touchline ready to come on and give his all for the club. I think they, the fact they're so ingrained in the club as well, you know, gives them that extra motivation to, to, to sort of show the fans what they do, and especially when they've been around for so long like these players have. So it's great news. I'm really pleased for the lad. I think he's gone away. He's, he's done the hard yards on his loans and everything, and he's he's put the effort in, he's put the work right in, and he's now benefiting from that, isn't he, with, with this hopeful chance now to, to shine next season. Yeah, and that moves us on to our recent shape slash pre-season of what just gone, which will lead us into the next two games and then potentially the big one 
against Newcastle on um, Newcastle on the Saturday at five thirty. Right, so, 12, uh, so we're gonna have a little. We're going to have a little look at a couple of things I saw against Brentford because I think it's important to go on a bit of a journey in this pre-season to, for the shape and the style of the team to maybe potentially get to an end position, what we think we're going to look like when we're going to be playing um, against Newcastle. So um, against Brentford, um, as you can see on the screen, we've gone to our tactical pad. Absolutely <laughs> love it, don't I? Uh, so what you can see here is Aston Villa's basic shape in a nutshell for the last two games. So you've got Pau Torres, who was a, uh, a centre-back playing on the left-hand side, basically playing at left-back. You had got uh, a defender here and another central defender here. We'd got Matty Cash who'd bombed on in this area. So we'd sort of reversed, in, in a sense, our shape of having the left back as an out and out left back yeah. or an out and out right back, being that sort of player that does that. But what we'd got is we'd got Philogene who was filling in that area and going in there. We'd got the, uh, the two in the double pivot. So you've got here and you've got here. And then you've got our four, which make up the front midfield four as, as an attack. You've got a DRB. You've got a, a McGinn going on a run here. You've got uh, Cash out there. And then you've got Ollie Watkins here. So this is the basic shape of what we've seen during the games, hasn't it? And I just want to touch yeah. on something that I felt in this game, we really, really struggled with, and we really struggled, in my opinion, with how Torres being on that left-hand side as sort of like the left-hand side defender, so technically a left-back. Um, and I felt like he looked a little bit isolated, didn't he? There was that one where, for their second goal, they cut inside, and then you've got the Embraimo chance where he ran behind him. So... What was your vibe on Torres being this left-hand side, but not having sort of like a left back next to him? Uh, yeah, it, it was you know something I think we we all thought would happen at some point, um, and, and and this game was the, the game we decided to try it. Yeah, we've inverted, if you like, the the attacking fullback because we went normally play left side attacking, but we've gone right side attacking, and I think you know these are the games to try it in, aren't they? Um, Will it? I don't know. Will it carry on? I think he does want to evolve into a back three. Whether that's an out and out back three or this sort of icing, um, the back three, which when you've got an attacking wing back either side, so you sort of when you're attacking, you have three at the back when you're defending, whichever attacking wing back you choose to have a left or right, then they sit in and make a back four. Um, it's going to evolve. It's going to be fluid. Uh, I think probably. We, we got caught out a couple of times with long balls. And was that because it was Pau Torres playing at slightly out of position? Or was it because the player in front of him was Bidace, who's not a natural sort of defensive player? Mm. So maybe they picked up on that and, and, and thought, well, you know, you've got a proper winger there playing attacking. So if we can maybe get the ball over the top, we could isolate Pau Torres with maybe a two-on-one there, which did happen a couple of times. But I think the one big thing that's come out of these pre-season games is this ball over the top that we are susceptible to. And we did see it a few Justin, times last season. We get we are gonna get onto that in a second, this ball over okay. the top. So I'll just But stop overall, you I think I, yeah, I thought he did pretty good considering you know it was the first time we tried it. Um I, I'm not averse really to knowing how many times that Pau Torres played as a left side as a, a, a back three. But, you know, these are the guys you've got to try, in, aren't they? This yeah. is what, the way he wants to evolve the team. So, uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see what he does now in the next two uh, games. Because, you know, if we are going to push forward with this, then, you know, we'll probably see it again against Lazio, maybe even Valencia as well. Yeah, so I am only highlighting this because this is just an area that I felt like against Brentford we really struggled at. So as you can see, this is what I mean. So we've we've got Pau Torres here, we've got Mings in the centre, we've got Conta, which is fine. I really like these three defenders, but I think this was a little bit maybe of an area where we did have a slight problem. If you go back to the Fulham game, so the game before, 
this is what it kind of looks like. So it looked like more like this. So we'd got we'd got Luca Dean in this position. So I felt like he looked a little bit more comfortable because he'd got this protection and maybe against Brentford, he didn't have as much protection. Uh, so that's just maybe something that I picked up on that I felt like against Fulham, this defence looked a little bit better looking like that. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think obviously when he's playing left side of the back three there, you have got an out and out left back there as the covering sort of player. And when we do slip back into a defensive formation, then Luca Dean does step back in left back and Pau just slots back in as a centre half. Whereas I think the other day, because we'd chosen the attacking right back, you know, he 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 probably isn't used to playing that system much. Um, whereas Concer probably has seen it a lot last season. Um, so, so it's probably easier for him to slot across and play as that in that role than than, than Torres was doing there. But as I keep saying, that's the reason you have pre season, isn't it? That's the reason we've played. Mm. And and in seasons gone by, we play five or six lower league teams, and you don't really you don't really get caught out by lower league sides because the quality probably isn't there. And yeah. you know we've played three decent sides really over in America, and and we have been caught out one or two times trying these little tiny adjustments and little tiny tiny different ways of playing so i'm not overly fussed about it if i'm honest at the moment um you know should it start creeping in a lot during games in the season then that's something i think you'd have to really take a look at and think okay you know this is a recurring problem now how do we solve that but you know we're trialing things we're looking how things are working we've got four phenomenal centre-halves now and then you throw Chambers into the mix as well so we, we are overloaded at the back with really good players so he has got to find a way to keep them all happy and and by dropping three centre-halves in you know you're going to play more of them aren't you you know they're going to get more game time but it's how to work it where you keep a defensive um, security if you like um and don't give as many goals away. We've looked like we score. We, we can look like we can score, you know, easily. You know, I don't think scoring goals is going to be a problem next season. I think at the moment it's just about trying to keep that back door closed. And how do we go about doing that whilst trying to keep on the offensive and keep pressing high and doing all these things we want to do and see? You've got to be careful, haven't you? And don't overcommit. Yeah, and I think the the thing about Emery and why Emery's so good is it's his meticulous detail. And I imagine yeah. that they're not really going into that much detail about these games. So imagine the second goal that Brentford scored, cutting inside on his left foot. I guess all week, if that was a Premier League game, he might have been told this player cuts inside on his left foot. Do not let him get on his left foot. Maybe that level of detail wasn't there in pre-season games. But something that we have spotted, and I think every Villa fan has spotted, is this high line. Now, this was the first for Brentford. So this is the one in which that they won their penalty from. And I think Mings ideally needs to be here or Konsa needs to be here covering this runner who's going down there. So th this was a bad one to concede, wasn't it really? Because you shouldn't be letting this runner here have a run from in his own half with not one of these two thinking, you know what, we've got to pick him up here. So it's just a, it's just that this high line's been exposed a bit, hasn't it? Yeah, this this is a difficult one. I can't, my memories in what it used to be, but I can't remember how quickly they turned the ball over here. But looking at just that still, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight players basically quite high up the pitch there in their final third, which leaves a two-on-one essentially at the back. And and even the centre-halves are quite high, aren't they? They're, they're sort of five yards inside their half. So with a good ball over the top and a very, very well-timed run, I know I remember watching it at the time with you both thinking he's miles offside here, but it was sort of a, 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 a you know a weird sort of visual um Thing because when the ball was played, because he'd made such a good run, he did look five, six yards offside, but he basically made timed his run to perfection. And it was a very good pass, you know. He's under a bit of pressure there, as you can see, the player passing the ball. Uh, and he's just, you know, lifted the ball over the top of Mings and, and they've got in. So is it because we were badly in a bad defensive positional shape? 
I don't really know. I think it was because we was committing ourselves forward. We was pressing up high and we lost the ball. This is one of the big problems of losing the ball when you're on a high press, isn't it? A lot of your players are up the pitch in the final third. And if you're playing against very good opposition who can, and you know, pick up the ball from a breakdown, then then they're going to have enough quality to, to to pick you off on the break. And a lot of Premier League clubs have got very pacey forwards and they've got very good midfielders that can pick a pass. So, I think it's something we need to keep an eye on, definitely. I think something they will be working on now and thinking, OK, we've been done three or four times in pre-season. Uh, that was the, of the goals that were scored, to be honest, let alone the ones that, that didn't lead to goals. So maybe other teams are going to start looking at it because it's been a high-profile tournament. So a lot of clubs in the Premier League will be looking at these games and using them as scouting, especially teams that we're playing early in the season. So it, it, it's something that's not a huge concern, but I think that the coaching staff, that they know what they're doing, don't they? They've seen this. That they, they, you know, they'll be working on it pretty hot behind the scenes, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. So this leads us on to there is a lot of there's a lot of noise on social media about Aston Villa, and a lot of people are picking Aston Villa as their dark horses, their the team in Europe to be looking at, etc. Um, and I just want to kind of get get your thoughts on it, just in that you know we're being talked about quite a lot. And I think there's quite a lot of like misconceptions about what we are and why we are going to be the force. Um, and for me, one thing that I I think of is the fact that we're so adaptable, we're so versatile, and that is why we are a force we reckon with. We want to win every game. We are there to win every game. And our systems and tactics are so adaptable. We're not one-dimensional. And I think that is why we're going to pose a lot of problems to Premier League sides. And I think we're going to be very difficult to live with. So, I mean, if we if we have a quick little look at just something here that we do that's just, just different in itself, is that when we're sort of defending a little bit of a... We're defending around our... Box. I know it's a little bit hard, but we go into this six-three-one. Um, we press with a, like we press with like a, a four-four-two, which is just. I mean that press. I mean we haven't even we haven't even spoke about that press since the game the other day. But that Villa press was absolutely phenomenal, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. It was fast. It was in their faces. It, it was just absolutely unreal that press. I don't think I've seen Villa press like that for absolutely years. So, you know, we, we, we're pressing a 4-4-2. We've got this box shape. We've got a winger that can sort of go out wide. Uh, we play this 3-2-4-1 formation as well, which now is really dynamic. So I think we've got we've got it all, haven't we? we, we we've got a lot. And I, and I think we're going to be a team that nobody wants to face. Our home form is absolutely unreal at the minute. If you go back to uh, last season, you know, Villa Park was absolutely amazing. Our away record was brilliant. We've got a good goal scorer up top. We've got options all over the pitch. We're going into Europe, but we've recruited well. We've got players that have played in Europe before. You've got Carlos, you've got Pau Torres, you've got... Um, who else have we got? We've got DRB. We've got players that have played in Europe. Hmm. T- that's the one. Tielemans, <laughs> a guy that's won the World Cup in goal. So yeah. th- what I'm trying to say is that for whatever argument you hear these opposition fans saying, but yeah, but Villa haven't got this, or yeah, but Villa are going to do this, or yeah, but Emery's a cup manager. Yeah, but Emery's never had a budget like he's got at Villa now. Emery's never no. had a club that's been built for him now. He's got his sporting director. He's got Vidagani. We've got a business guy. Everything that Emery needs, he has got, where he hasn't had that before. And I think what last season proved was give Emery the tools and he will do the rest. And that is what we've done. So we've gave him everything that he needs to succeed. And it's just going to be amazing. And, and that is why we are a force to be reckoned with, because no stone will be left unturned. And we, we're going to be amazing, man. Aren't we, Justin? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be an incredible season. I can't wait for it to start. I think 
you know, the, the two things for me is, is next season we're not going to be surprised anymore. You know, we, we surprised a lot of people uh, after Emery took out because we, we were down the bottom. We wasn't really seen as a big threat. You know, we'd, we'd hired a very good manager, got a very good track record, but he was taking over a team that was struggling at the bottom of the league and, and nobody foresaw what was to come in those last sort of few months of the season. And he turned us around and he turned us into a proper, a proper top-end Premier League outfit. But what's going to happen at the start of this season is that everybody knows now we are top-end Premier League outfit. So for me, the biggest threat to Aston Villa next season is Aston Villa. And what I mean by that is, is the mentality has to be there where it was last season. And there's no reason to think that will change. You know, we've got elite manager, we've got elite coaches, we've got the, everything at Villa now to, to succeed. And we are signing players, like you've said, that have all done it at the top level. So, you know, to compete... Anywhere near the top end of the Premier League, you've got to be on it week in, week out. And we've got players now throughout the squad, throughout the team, in every position, that will know how to, to compete and will know what is expected of them to be an elite competitor in the Premier League and the Cup competitions. And now, added to that, Europe, you know, it's going to be a brutal schedule. We know that. We know what's coming two games a week, hopefully, when we get through, if we get through uh, you know, the qualifier. So we've got a lot of games coming. We've got a lot of football to play. Uh, we've got a lot of very good players. We've got a fantastic manager. We've got a sold-out Villa Park, more or less guaranteed every single week. And a way following that's absolutely incredible. As long as the players can keep the momentum going from last season, and we saw it, dare I say, I'm not suggesting we're going to do a Leicester, but when Leicester was struggling down the bottom and they had that really momentous end to the season, they were able to keep it going the following season and look what happened to them. As I say, I'm not suggesting we're going to win the league next season. What I'm saying is we can use the momentum that we've gained already under Unai Emery and you know what, what the perception of us now from other clubs and other fans is. We are a very good team. You know, I've spoken to Bournemouth fans this summer on the Bournemouth pod that we, we, we sort of talked to and the Everton pod we talked to and talked to them and they're all saying that they expect us to have a good season next season so we've got to manage this expectation now and we've got to be good enough to to see that through uh, and I think we will be I really do I think I think going forward we, we know we're a good side we can see with our eyes the three friendlies you know we at times for spells in those games we've looked incredible you know, and but you know, other times we've looked like you know we need to switch on a little bit more. We've made a few mistakes, but that's okay at the moment. We're, we're pre-season still. I'm just excited. I can't wait to get going. To have a team like this to look forward to watching week in, week out. You know, <laughs> these kind of moments don't happen very often. I, I, I've been around a long time now, forty odd years, watching the Villa, and you know, I've had two probably two spells, maybe three. If I'm, I'm lucky of, of watching a, a team that's everything's gelled together with a brilliant manager, a very good squad of players, and we've looked like we're going to do something. And this is one of them. In so in forty odd years, three or four times I've seen this. So these kind of things don't come around very often for for, for us. So let's just enjoy the ride, get behind the lads, and log mate, continue. And this is what I'm. This is what I think it's. This is our time now. This yep. is this is Aston Villa's time. Um, so we got to go for it. Um, so let's just touch on a little bit of news. Burnley may be bidding for Aaron Ramsey. Aaron Ramsey, yeah. Ten mil. Can't see. I can't see a seven. Can you? I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised. It would say a lot about what the manager thinks of him, I suppose. But, you know, he's another player with a huge reputation. Uh, coming through the ranks at Villa, you know, we all know what Jacob Ramsey is and how good he is. And I've always had the opinion that Aaron could be better if given the chance. Um, it's a lot of money for a player that hasn't played for us. Well, I don't think he's had one or two appearances, has he, for the first team? Uh, but he's got a, he's got a fantastic reputation. He did himself no harm last season again with a couple of loans in the Championship. So the fact that a team that's promoted into the Premier League are looking to, to, to put good money down for a player like him, for me, tells you, you know, the quality of the lad. And I think for £10 million, you know, we're not hard up. We haven't got to sell. We're not in a position where we need to sort of balance the books at the moment. I, I wouldn't like to. Maybe a loan to Burnley could be a good idea because we mm. keep his registration. 
Uh, and I saw somebody else say maybe selling with a buyback clause, which I know Man City do a lot, you know. I don't know. I still think there's a there's a very good player with Aaron Ramsey. So I'd like to personally see him go out on loan um, and then come back and do a maybe what Philogene Badais has done, I think. Yeah, definitely. It, it feels like there's a couple of them that are quite special and yeah. the nurturing, their growth, their loan spells. It feels like that that's happening to benefit Villa as well, so it has to, it has you know, to, mate. A, a, like a, a, Fien, a Fiene, like the loan spell is going to be huge for him. We, we all yeah, know yeah. that we've got a player there, and we're really excited, but this loan spell is massive, so you know. But I think also, grows. Luke, it, it sh- sorry, it shows that what we're doing is he's, he's, he's great in, in, in that academy. You know, we, we, we keep repeating this, but we go down quite a lot to the academy. And that, they struggled a little bit last season, uh, sort of midway through. And that's because a lot of players that, that we have got on our books were all out on loan. You now, our better players of that age group, if they go out on loan, yes, it's nice. It's a lovely ground down at Villa in the 21s and you see some really good players and there's some good games. But the, the benefit, it's far more beneficial to go out on loan and play first team football in League One, Championship, League Two, and, and you know, and play and, and learn and, and sort of and develop there. Um, and then we can see the 16, 15, 16, 17 year olds, which we saw with um, uh, with Kellyman, you know, coming through at 16 and look what's happened to him. So, you know, we're doing something right in our, in our academies. And, and, and these players, if you know, Fergie did it brilliantly when, it, when he had that amazing time at United he signed top players to, to play straight away but they also kept bringing these kids through and, and they'd have five or ten games in the first team and, and their reputation was so high at United that, that half of these players that didn't ever make the grade at Man United they were selling them for five and ten million pounds a time you know it's it, it, it's it's, well, it's, it's that, development it's that thing, thing of it? like Vinny years ago isn't it it's like I remember like years ago and it'd be like, oh, we're signing this player on loan. And then you're like, but he's not our player. Like we're developing somebody yeah. else's player. We want, we want, we, yeah, but we want the opposite to it, don't we? We yeah, want, yeah, we want our the players. To develop, you, yeah. you develop our players yeah. and then we'll have them and then we'll reap the benefits as well. I mean, for me, we, we, we've seen a lot of our youth players go out last year on Championship League One loans. I think now we've got a group of players there that would benefit now from going to a Burnley or a Luton, you know, or Sheffield United and playing Premier League football uh, because I think that they're not far off it now. And and I think there's some really good attacking and, and defensive players now. So, it, it, you know, the youth is just as exciting for me as the first team. So uh, how this season develops will be very interesting. Yes, definitely. Right. So that's quite a longer episode than I expected it to be. But there we go. Nice little chat with Justin. Um, So we'll be back on Thursday evening for our watch along. So come and join us. I know a lot of you have really been enjoying watching those with us. So uh, come and join us for that. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Up the villa. I'll be at Bescott. See you later. (laughs) See you later.